I'm Lisa Senecal. And I'm Maya May, and we're speaking with Juliet Kayyem, former Assistant Secretary for Homeland Security, about how to keep the violent calls from Trump supporters from going from online crybabies to real-world violence. We're speaking starts now. Well, what a week. What a week. What a, what a every damn day when we wake up. Um, yeah, by now, we know waiting for a return to the political norms is like waiting for Donald Trump to become presidential. It just ain't going to happen. But that doesn't mean that we're powerless or that we have to accept like complete batshit crazy as the new norm. We can't prevent all the chaos and disasters, but we can get a lot better at reacting effectively when they do happen. And one way to mitigate the disaster that is Donald Trump and the Republican Party's assault on our democracy is through accountability. Though this week has shown that accountability also comes with some of its own risks, but we still do it. Yes, we still do it. But I have to say, I'm still at the point where I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is the thing that we have been waiting for all of this time. It's like the main event has started, but I feel like I'm still catching up. Like I'm not even at the stadium yet. And we've been seeing this accountability come in, like with the Alex Jones situation, like we know it's coming. But still, it's like. I don't know if we're ready for what's coming because a lot of us are all now racing to figure out what this means and if it will stoke the violence that so many ha have feared. So I'm really excited about tonight's guest because I'm a real big disaster management and crisis management geek. She doesn't believe me, um, but, it's very, <laughs> but it's very true. I'm super into this stuff. Uh, she's a former assistant secretary for Homeland Security under President Obama and the faculty chair of the Homeland Security Program at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and the author of The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in an Age of Disaster, which is right now. And she has a new piece out in The Atlantic on the FBI search for Mar of Mar-a-Lago, which we will talk about. Please welcome Juliet Kayam to the show. Oh, oh she's there. I am. Thanks for Thank having me. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> we are here. We are here. We are here. I wasn't sure if you dashed off to like a yeah, you know, the fire alarm. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm here. It was like a slow. It, it was it, uh, the anticipation helped. Now everyone's very excited. About That's this. right. <laughs> well, we're so glad you're here. Oh, um, you Thank are. You the perfect person. Well, you're the perfect person for everybody to be speaking to pretty much at any time, <laughs> all the time right now. But we're going to we're going to focus in um, and, and start at least by talking about the FBI uh, raid of Mar-a-Lago this week. Can you set the table yeah. for us? So it's interesting. I mean, I, I, the the speculation is rampant. So I, I'm going to, and I'm a lawyer by training, but I haven't practiced in forever. So I'm going to put the reasons why, or like, you know, what the foundation was to this to aside and just mark it as a moment, like a, in, in, in the book, you know, I, I talk about left a boom before the moment, right a boom after the moment. So, so Monday night was a boom. It was, it was significantly different to make that gesture. And to, what did that mean? What were the consequences? Well, there's going to be the legal and political consequences, but there's also prepared. I didn't turn my phone off. Um, there's going to be the legal and uh, political consequences, but there's also the violence, safety and security ones. So almost immediately you saw, uh, and I want to be clear here, violent you know, MAGA, like, you know, the, the, the ideology. I mean, this is the violence I'm focused on, not, uh, not on the supporters, whatever it is. It's the violence that, that Trump has unleashed over six years. And I call it sort of the violence as an extension of politics has become the norm, right? You think, think of the way he talks, think of the way many politicians talk now. And so uh, th they were on fire. I mean, I had never seen anything like this since January 6th. Um, and they're, they caught on to the notion of civil war, that this was the triggering boom moment for a civil war. So I don't want to minimize it. It's real uh, and it's um, and it's challenging and it's and it's and it's nurtured, if not directed by Trump, uh, but also the apparatus. I mean, you look at some of the 
language, for example, used by Marco Rubio and some other of the GOP influencers, you know, um, who even use civil war. I mean, what does that even mean? I mean, what, are, are you threatening us with guns? Like, I mean, or is it just a bravado? So the piece or the way I would hope people think about it in the in, in trying to reset norms or trying to at least just not freak out about everything is that it's real. Trump's use of violence is real. I never doubted that. And I, you know, I, I call him, you know, the leader of a terrorist organization. I don't I don't have any problems doing that. But uh, but also to remember how a violent ideology ends. And I think this is where the left can get itself into uh, into an unhelpful position for themselves. Right. I mean, in other words, if you think that the only end is he ends up in a jumpsuit in a federal prison facility, you are likely to be disappointed or it will, may take a very long time. But if you think success can also be measured in, is, is the ideology growing or dissipating? And because that's how ideologies end, or that's how, that's how you win. Ideologies don't end. They uh, stop winning is basically the point of the, of the article. And I think then you can start to see some metrics that are starting to look really good. I mean, the, the leadership has turned on itself on a lot of these violent organizations. 800 of them are under arrest or indictment, the, the sort of core group. Even when the announcement was made about Mar-a-Lago, what was it, 20 people showed up to support Trump at Mar-a-Lago? I mean, that's you know, dozens, like dozens is not a civil war. And um, he's isolated, he's uh, deplatformed. Uh, he, um, you know, the politics of this are, he's, he's not a, a, a the, the party, at least as it polls, would be pretty content, I think, with an alternative if they could get him out of the way. Um, and so just thinking about ways in which the ideology of violence as an extension of politics is actually taking some hits and I think it's important for people to hear because it can feel very futile, right? It's like, oh, my God, these people are talking about civil war and Trump is still Mar-a-Lago and whatever. Like, There are many ways to measure success. And this is in the counterterrorism world. This is how we measure it. Can you we're not going to end the ideology. I'm not going to worry about the, the supporters. I mean, the, the idea that how they feel matters to me. I can give crap. Honestly, I could give crap at this stage. Right. Oh, we're going to enrage his base. You know, as I tweeted yesterday, right. his base has been enraged. Right. When are they? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But you bring up a really good point about the GOP leadership yeah. because it seems like they're going all in with the violent rhetoric. Like I actually fully expected people to kind of come out and say, okay, finally, like this is yeah. it. But they're not. And so as a Homeland Security expert, like what would you say to like the GOP right now, these leaders who are coming yeah. out and clearly putting out messaging that's a little bit, eh. So, so there's some of them that are, but there's some of them that the silence is sort of telling. I thought McConnell's response was not pro-Trump. It was like, you know, weirdly process-oriented. They're looking at the polling too. I mean, they, look, I mean, I, I don't, this is again, I don't get fixated on ideology. There's gonna be a core of people that, I'll, that will never change. And I mean, you, you two live in the Twitterverse too. Like, those people are going to bang their head against a wall if they're thinking about the jerk who posts this or the podcast host who does this, like whatever. What you want to look at is, 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 the, is, um, is the movement strengthening since January 6th? The answer is no. I mean, just you, technically, I can just tell you in terms of the number, the fundraising, that it's noisier and we like to focus on it, but it, it, it's not getting bigger. It's getting smaller. But the other is, are there sufficient off ramps for people who might have voted for Trump once or twice or voted for him once and then not voted for Biden? Are there sufficient off ramps? And this is where I think the January 6th committee has been so successful that if you mm -hmm. if you view the January 6th committee as solely about setting a legal predicate, you might again be disappointed. But if you view them as running the most public like counterinsurgency campaign I've ever imagined. Like if I ever write a new book, I, uh, once, I, once you finish a book, you're like, never again. But like next, <laughs> it would be on like the January 6th committee as a counterinsurgency. That's what they've done. Because what you want to do is provide people an off-ramp. And that, in, in that sense, I think they've also been successful. Well, the, 
the media also has a role oh. to play in all of this. And you, you talked about the 20 people who are outside yeah. Mar-a-Lago and that the, the, there is a lot of chatter, but, yeah. but truly um, from a, a counterterrorism perspective, Homeland Security shrinking. Yes. That's not what, no. when I watched those, the, the footage of those couple dozen people outside Mar-a-Lago, it reminded me of like hurricane coverage yeah. where every time they just keep playing the continuous loop of that one sign waving wildly in the breeze right. to make you feel as though. Yeah. That we're oh, under, yeah. yeah, and that and that we don't have this thing contained. No, I mean, part, it is true. And I, you know, I'm on air for CNN. I, I get it. And I try to put stuff in perspective on air and try to, you know, so, sort of say, okay, here's the other metrics and stuff. But I think, um, I, I, you know, that's a little bit of what people in my space are trying to do, which is, you know, it is noisier. It is more violent. I mean, the Civil War stuff, but um, but other metrics suggest that um, that like other terror groups, it is finding it hard to grow without the win. So we just have to keep depriving them the win. And I don't mean political win because he's getting plenty of those. I mean, I mean, literally their ability to organize, raise money, be amongst um, company. I mean, I mean, honestly, like, I don't know, all, all of our weekend coverage or all the weekend coverage was on that... Um, is it CPAC, the Hungarian? Yeah, CPAC. Yeah. yeah. So, Victor Orban. I mean, do you know what I took away from that? I saw a picture on Twitter that showed it was about a quarter filled. I would have, that would have been my story, which is mm -hmm. even see that the, the CPAC tent is, is incredibly small. I mean, it didn't, I mean, yeah, there's always going to be the crazies. And this is funny because this is a little bit about my book, but can we start to, to switch the lens and say, what dynamics are going on that suggest that we are winning or that, or, or we're not losing and they're not winning. Uh, you know, a stalemate you know, is, is, is not bad. That's a little bit what I do with the book, which is we're always talking about the bad things. Are there stories of success, even amongst the failure, mm -hmm. that we can tell that are saying, okay, well, we've learned. All right. Well, and I, it reminds me sort of the art of war yeah. um, where it's like they're pretending to be strong where they're weak. Like this is their last ditch yeah. effort sort of thing. But at the same time, I'm concerned. Like I, there was like a whole Trump supporters tent set up outside my local grocery store. Yeah. And so I'm thinking about these like lone wolves. And I wonder if a lot of people are thinking about that too. So like yeah. from a Homeland Security standpoint, like what is, you know, what would you recommend? What is being done right, right now to kind of like stem that fear or that potentiality for violence. Right. So that's exactly right. So once again, like exactly what you said, my like, it's like the Trump supporter is not the problem. We'd like them to change their mind or whatever. It is the, the one who would, who listens to him. Right. I mean, it's his, it's his mission mm -hmm. that, that, that should he have a block on the political side, then you turn to violence. I mean, that's clearly what happened uh, over the course of the sort of post-election period. And those of us who were monitoring were like, he's changing his tune. This is not about a stolen election. It is about violence. So, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, on, so this is not, again, I'm a glass half full person. This is not about um, uh, uh, changing people's minds. It is keeping them from violence. And the the best way of the de-radicalization is the, is the community itself. So, so and 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 you saw this with some of the people who testified in January 6th. They get in a cocoon, and this is QAnon success. They get in a, a cocoon. That cocoon takes them down. So they're not they're not perceiving other things. So if you have a community member or someone who you know who's like falling down that path, in particular of violence, there are, there are practical things that have to be dealt with, right? Are, do they have access to guns? Is this you know should, should we have? Should, is there a red flag law that might? Uh, be relevant. All of them always tip their hat what they're going to do. None of them are, none of these are like surprises, right? In, in that, in that technical sense. And then also then, uh, you know, community support for the off ramp. And this is where, I guess I have a line in the piece where I say, and the GOP has been given more off ramps than they deserve, right? I mean, there are, there are so many times and all it would have taken was three or four senators saying we're exiting or, you know, 
cry me a river about their horrible candidates, right? For Senate and stuff. They know how, I mean, they know how to control a primary, right? If the GOP knows anything, it knows, and it's just, they, they've completely given it over to these, these um, contentious primaries of which all you need is 21% or 19% or whatever these people are getting. And you're the next, you're the candidate for secretary of state in Arizona. Like, I mean, you know, and, and you'll lose, right. And I'm, I'm not crying. I'm, I'm not crying over this. I'm a Democrat, mm -hmm. but uh, it is, they know how to do this. So hopefully I do see signs that that's starting to happen. Um, he's a lie. They know that Trump's a liability. Right. Right. It's how to, yeah. how to move him out right. of the so way the thing. effectively. Exactly. So I'm, I'm really, I, I want to jump back a minute to the, the Mar-a-Lago yeah. um, search because we know they seized a, a lot of documents that um, for whatever reason were the ones selected by yeah. uh, the Trump administration or Trump to take when they left the White House. So I, I don't want to get too deep into speculating what could be in those boxes, but what do you think could be in those boxes? Yeah. <laughs> so which well, one I national security. I mean, I can't read tea leaves, so I don't know, but I can read. I mean, I, I put it a different way because that sounds a little bit. Here's what. Here's what these offices do. I've been. A, I have been. In my, I started my career as an attorney at DOJ. There was no national security division, but I had started off in security issues at D, DOJ. So. Okay, so the, the people investigating come from the office that deals with, right, classified information, improper disclosure. So, okay, that's one thing. So it's not the tax division. So that tells me something that, you know, there's a, okay. And the other, the other piece that I thought that I think is just rem interesting to remember is Trump has already given up a lot of stuff. He has already acknowledged he took incorrect stuff there. So he wants to, um, so he, he gives up. So then- so then that pool of boxes or whatever they took that are, that he wanted, why did he want it? So there's different theories. There's the sort of Maggie Haberman theory that he has weird allegiances to like love letters from Kim and stuff and doesn't want to give those up, that those are things that he likes to show people. There's the Russia and then there's the Saudi. So those are your three options, right? So one is he's just crazy and has these weird fetishes. Uh, the other is uh, he's some form of agent or supportive of Russia and um, and therefore wanted to keep these for whatever reason. Or the third is it's for business interest in Saudi Arabia. Those are, those are your three. Oh, the bombs. I was going to say, it could be a hat trick. Oh, right, 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 right. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I don't know if I buy into the you know, his weird fetishes one. I mean, he's a guy who, I mean, it's all about money. I mean, he's just a grifter. I mean, he's just a, that's like, he's like, just a disgusting grifter. I mean, look at, look at him with Roe, like, you know, with the Roe decision, like, I mean, not my lane, but I certainly care about it. But like, of course he was surprised and annoyed that they overturned. I mean, he has no values. He has no opinions. It's just, did it help him or doesn't it hurt him? Does it make it more likely he'll be president or not president? Does it hurt Ivanka or not hurt Ivanka? I mean, it's that's what this is about. Yeah, well, and, and that's the thing. We're all seeing it and we're all hoping for that accountability. And yet we're also seeing them do things that don't make any sense. At all. Like right, the, the hypocrisy is like so yeah. clear right now. And so they're the back the blue crowd. Oh, but, I know. Now they want to disband everything, right? So I know, and I love the like. I love the like the FBI director. He's your guy. He's the guy you brought in because you fired our guy, who wasn't even our guy. He was a he was a Republican. I, you know, I mean, it's like it was like a long line of white Republican men have run the FBI. Like I was like, everyone take a chill pill, right? So this is, but this is also where. You know, there's the noisy people who are doing that. But I also, you know, one of the things is like, you know, the, 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 um, you know, who's in the cheap seats or the, or proverbial cheap seats. Mm -hmm. I do think some of the quiet around this or the, the focus on 
process rather than substance because no one wants to vouch for Trump because they don't know actually what's in those boxes uh, or, or whatever the storyline is, is, is are signs of softening. As I said, like, you know, my people, as I say, like, you know, Democrats on Twitter and Democrats, like they want the blow. Right. They want, you know, the, you know, the, 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 you know, he's hit it out of the ballpark. He's gone forever. He's erased. Everyone who supported him apologizes, you know, like I'm, I'm being, I'm caricaturing it, but they, they want a moment. And as I wrote in the pieces, like this savior idea, get over it. It is, is, is it going up or is it going down? Like, this is our measurement of success. And, um, and, and not every day is going to be the same. I, I love that you are a half a glass half full person. We we try very hard to hang on to that. Sometimes it's sort of like you know fingertips at this point. But there there's a delicate balance between um, staying engaged and vigilant and working hard and yeah. making sure that that there isn't a resurgence of this and not um, allowing. Uh, a sense yeah. of futility to yeah. set in. And so people don't do anything. So how, how do you balance yeah. those? Well, I mean, well, I have, a, I had a line all throughout Trump. I, I did I do a weekly segment on our local NPR and it was called pace the rage. I mean, part of it is pacing. And I do, I mean, for people who are politically engaged and people who follow me or, or no, like I mentioned Rose, so I kind of just violated it, but um, I do try to stick to my, to lanes. Because I don't have, one, I don't have the bandwidth for outrage all the time. And like you got, you know, I have other parts of my life and whatever. But also I think then people will value your voice or your input or your contribution on that thing. So I sometimes think like, you know, it can't possibly be that my opinion on Roe, radicalization, the environment, you know, Senator Graham and the, you know, the, the election in, uh, in Georgia, it cannot be that I, that I need to expend energy on all of them. Right. And so I, I actually, it's funny you say that because I, it, it was more strategic than it sounds for me after Trump was no longer president. I didn't like what, not what I had become, but I felt like I had built this career in government, outside of government, corporate media, about something that I actually knew about and was an expert in, was teaching in. And then I had been, you know, all over the place as we all were. So I, and maybe that's helpful to people. Like maybe it's not ratcheting back. It's just focusing the energy and the other piece. Yeah. And I say this in the, or actually the New Yorker did a, did something on the, on the book and me did like a profile and the, and the reporter asked the best question, which I constantly am repeating. So she says, what's the difference between um, uh, uh, preparedness and paranoia and panic. And mm -hmm. I, and I like, I just knew it because I'm a mother of three kids. So I sort of have learned to give myself a break, which is it's perfection, right? I mean, in other words, if you're, if you are looking for unicorns and rainbows and America is in some ways, you know, why can't we get to this place? And these people are so horrible, but for them, we would have a world of, yeah, that's true. But for them, maybe things would be as you want them to be, but they're not. So, you know, how can you get to 80% or 70% or whatever that's going to get you it? So, uh, and I think a little bit of this is the piece I had written before in the Atlantic, right before this one was uh, looking at the January 6th committee as a counter insert as a public counter insurgency campaign. And I, I honestly believe this. I, I, yes, I like accountability, whatever. But if ultimately this ends with him alone, with his grifters at Mar-a-Lago, with his kids making money off, off their name, like there are worse fates for America. And that is that he's the next president of the United States, oh. right? So as, as part of it is like, I don't need it to be perfect. <laughs> it's like, That's, I, mean, I, I have only one goal. I mean, I, honestly. So if it means that he's, you know, happy and rich, I could care less. If he's president again, the system, I'm telling, you want to say I'm half glass full? Here's like half totally empty. If the, the system cannot, will not function. Well, because he wants to dismantle it and they all want to dismantle it. 
made it super clear, which yeah. is why, you know, when you talk about preparedness and you mentioned in your book that in a way we all have to be disaster man managers and crisis yeah. managers. I want to be in your lane right now. Yeah. I need to know, like, I loved watching Scandal. I don't want to yeah. live in Scandal. Oh, so. that's hilarious. Yeah. You so don't. No, what, right. <laughs> what can you like say to like just yeah. the average person the at viewers ourselves like yeah. how do we adopt the mindset yeah that will help us through the coming months yeah so it's i mean you know first of all i mean the first chapter is called get your head around it for a reason which is i think surprise disappointment panic come from some belief that things will be different than we know how they are i mean this is the devil never sleeps the title of the book is if you can begin to position yourself for the other side of the boom, then we're taking the surprise element out of everything. And surprise leads to nothing good when you, you don't prepare, but you tend to then focus on woe is me. Why did this happen? So I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm high energy. I'm not terribly emotive. Like in the sense, like, I, you know, people who go on line or on TV, like, oh, this is the most horrible thing. Like, how is that helpful to people? Like, how is that helpful to you? Like, yeah, of course it's the most horrible thing, but X, Y, and Z. So that, I mean, that to me is, is it. And I think, you know, linking the book with what, what we're talking about, the, the, one of the things about the book is, is, you know, how do you learn to fail safer? And so one of the chapters is about, um, is, is, well, two that would be relevant is, I mean, one is, is, uh, is essentially layered defenses. Like don't have a single point of failure. I mean, in other words, don't set up a system or a way of thinking or even a, a political strategy in which he has to be in jail for it to work. Because I just don't know if that's happening. If that's not happening, then what's my strategy so that he's not president, right? So part of it is the political strategy. Part of it is the, deep, the, 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 the counterinsurgency strategy, which hurts mm -hmm. him. It does. Because he, you know, he doesn't have that threat factor as much as he did. I remind your viewers, he cannot fill a room. So whatever you're seeing on Twitter, any of his rallies, he cannot fill anymore. So that's awesome. Like that's like humiliate him until, you know, he, um, so that's one thing. And then, and then the other is engagement. So part of getting your head around it is I own this. This is me. I have agency. And, um, you know, the big part of the book is like, we're a horrible species. We're also pretty awesome. Like we have a, we don't have to sit passively waiting for bad things to happen that we can assert agency and, and engage. And whether it's through voting or, or the single lane issue, which I tend, you know, single, uh, single issue lane, which is what I tend to do. And um, uh, it's that engagement that gives you empowerment, not for perfection, but just for something that's the standard of the book, which is of course less bad. Less bad is good, right? And I'm, I don't try to get to good. Like good, I don't know what it looks like and I don't know if I've ever been there, but like less bad is good. So I urge people to get engaged, whether it's disaster preparedness or crisis management or whatever. It's that, it's that ownership uh, that, um, that gives us agency rather than, yeah, rather than the, um, the sort of passiveness. Can I, can I give a cocktail party story from the book? Please. All right. So there's nothing you, I mean, if you don't get nothing from the book, I mean, you either, it will save your life or you will have good stories for cocktail parties. Okay. So, um, but one of the things I realized is I had never looked up the word disaster and I was like, what does it actually mean? And it's the most interesting thing. So dis means not obviously an aster is from the stars and it was a belief, right. That, that, that the bad thing happening was random and rare and was a misalignment of the stars and was surprised. And I realized like that has such a hold on us, that idea mm -hmm. that, that, that humankind is in a passive position and that there's this like, you know, misalignment or mistake or whatever. And so I sort of try to, try to fight that, you know, yeah. that I try to say, say like, like, let's take this. So the book is like, basically let's take the surprise out of it. The devil never sleeps. Right. And right. I should say the second part of the quote, it's a quote from someone I have a weird job. So I end up getting invited to like weird. I don't get invited to fun parties. I get invited to like the Joplin tornado <laughs> anniversary. Right? Like, that's like, that's like my party. Right. It's like, I like watch the Grammys. That's like, that looks like more fun. But the, my <laughs> party is Joplin tornado that killed over a hundred people anniversary. Uh, but I, the woman I met was in charge of sort of preparing them for the next tornado. And, and um, I, you know, I, you know, everyone's faith is different. So she's very, very, 
devout woman. And, uh, and I think, you know, people like me can think, oh, she has her faith and like, that's what gets her through it. But it was like the most amazing thing because her faith was so tactical and so strategic. It was like, I mean, she's basically saying like, like God gave us agency, let's assert it. Like it was so awesome rather than the Jobian, like God works in mysterious ways. She's like, you know, like, God damn it. God's bringing another tornado for whatever reason. And she said, the, so I said, how are you like this? Like, she's the happiest person. And we lost a hundred people in the small community. And she says, I live in, in um, Missouri. There's going to be more tornadoes, right? The devil never sleeps. But the rest of her line was, but he only wins if we don't do better next time. We just have to make yeah. things less bad. That's like less bad. So yeah, less bad is good. I, less you're, bad you're, is good. That's my that's my bumper sticker. Pace the rage, and now less bad is good. Yeah, the your um your ability to to make people realize they have agency, and that you know we have in, in on one of the signs for our show. You know we use you know we are the people we've been waiting for. Yes, like, stop I waiting. That. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, right? this, no, is, I mean, this is, like, is on us. Because the alternative is capable. Is what? Right. I mean, that's why I have a line in the Atlantic piece that we've been talking about. It's like, Trump is not Voldemort. Like, we, we have this yes. idea that, like, you know, oh, Trump and all of his people are doing this. It's like, well, sc honestly, screw them and their feelings. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you're going to threaten civil war. Well, guess what? You can't freaking fill a room. You can't fill a room anymore. So you're, you know, is your cosplay civil war is what I call it. Like, bring it on, you know. Um, so... I absolutely, I, I love this. It's about managing expectations. Yeah. And I love this idea of strategic faith um, yeah. and being pragmatic. It's, I'm going to watch the zombie movies because I know I, you recommend that. So yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, it's so true. It is. Uh, yeah. So Maya is picking up on like, you know, the, the, there actually were psychological studies of people who could handle the pandemic better and um, not, not, preppers they weren't talking about preppers they were like people like us who like just you know found themselves like in a situation that they didn't and the people who mentally handle it better at a certain economic stability i mean if you lost your job or something but people who who could keep the trains running were those who had watched um who who were uh uh, uh, uh focused on the zombie genre they, they like the zombie series and stuff and the reason why is they sort of anticipated an amorphous threat and they understood it, but they also understood in the more recent zombie genres, in the 1950s, all the humans die, all the zombies win, much more complicated now because humans are asserting agency. So it can't be that the zombies get to thrive and the humans die. So it's it's a really interesting um, uh, sort of like study of the zombie genre where Americans, I mean, uh, humans begin to adapt to a threat and therefore survive. Yep. And and that's what you're helping us do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh my gosh, you guys are so fun. Thank you. Your, your book is amazing. The the article in the Atlantic's fantastic. I encourage everybody to read it. Um, thank you so much, Juliet, for joining us today. This has been a blast. Oh, yes. thank you. Me too. I'm really, I'm really pleased. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And please come back anytime. I so, will. Because the crisis always, work always, is always <laughs> news on this front. All right, thank you. I am feeling like invigorated because it is about agency and in a lot of ways, a lot of the um, the distress that I think a lot of the Trump supporters do actually feel is because they no longer or they feel they no longer have agency over their lives, right? And so right. It's about agency to be able to act in this moment that we're in logically, strategically, um, and not through fear. Because um, right. as Juliet pointed out, their numbers are dwindling. So on the pro-democracy side, I feel like things are actually I, looking up. That's, that's what I'm going to say. Yeah. And, and a, a lot of it um, is because there are so many people like, like the folks who are part of the Lincoln Project. And I mean that broadly, all the people who support the Lincoln Project in so many different okay. ways. It's because these people, all of you out there, you've realized that you have agency. Mm -hmm. And because of that, you're taking action, you're doing all sorts of different things. We thank you for it. If you are able to support us financially, large, small, it all mm -hmm. makes a difference. It all helps 
expand the agency that all of us have and the impact that we can have to make sure that we take the MAGA zombies and have them end up like isolated on some remote uninhabited island. It's okay if there's still a few of them left. We just need to get them, you know, separated from normal society and the rest of us can thrive. Yeah, just chill them out a little bit. Um, and if you can't donate, of course, you can share our shows. That always helps share our shows with your friends and family. You can follow Lisa at LC Senecal and me at Maya on stage. And uh, now we have uh, The Breakdown with Tara Setmayer and Rick Wilson returning tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, 4 p.m. Pacific. Yep. And yeah, and with that, we'd actually like to end on a high note. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, we have a new uh, a new ad from the Lincoln Project. It's so important to acknowledge, as we talked about tonight, all the good stuff that's happening. Incredibly good stuff is happening because of the work of Joe Biden. We want to acknowledge that. Take a look at the Lincoln Project's new ad called Getting Shit Done. And we'll see what is politics about? MAGA Republicans believe it is all about chaos, owning the libs, white grievance and anger. That's wrong. Governing is about making our lives better. In just one piece of legislation, Democratic senators took action to lower prescription drug prices, giving Medicare the ability to negotiate with Big Pharma, shifted tax burden from the middle class to the very wealthy, protected our future with the most sweeping climate change action in U.S. history. What do you want? Anger or results? Results. 